Hello and welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I'm of course your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 193rd episode, our guest is Dr. Bandy X. Lee. Dr. Bandy X. Lee is a forensic psychiatrist and violence expert who was a fellow of the National Institute of Mental Health and faculty member at Yale Law School of Medicine for 17 years. Since 2002, she has served as consultant to the World Health Organization and is now president of the World Mental Health Coalition. In addition to her clinical work in correctional and public sector settings, she was director of research for the Center for the Study of Violence, founder and director of Yale's Violence and Health Study Group, and project leader for an academic collaborators group for the WHO. She consulted with governments on violence prevention programming internationally and within the U.S., as well as helped with prison reform, including New York City's once notorious Rikers Island. She designed the Global Health Studies course, Violence, Causes and Cures, at Yale College, which led to her textbook, Violence, an interdisciplinary approach to causes, consequences, and cures. She published more than 100 peer review articles and chapters, 17 edited scholarly books, and journal special issues, nearly 300 op-eds, and the New York Times bestseller, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 37 psychiatrists and mental health experts assess a president. Her latest book is Profile of a Nation, Trump's Mind, America's Soul. A quick programming note. Near the end of the episode, we allude to, but do not address directly, a complaint filed last month by Dr. Lee against Yale University. For background, here is part of a Tuesday, March 23rd story in the Yale Daily News, which I will also link to in the show notes. Dr. Bandy Lee, a formerly Yale-affiliated faculty member in the Department of Psychiatry in School of Medicine, filed a complaint against the university on Monday alleging unlawful termination due to her exercise of free speech about the dangers of Donald Trump's presidency. University spokesperson Karen Peart declined to comment on the specifics of the case. Yale was the only named defendant. Lee's complaint alleges that Yale fired her in response to a January 2020 tweet that characterized just about all of former President Donald Trump's supporters as suffering from shared psychosis and said that Alan Dershowitz, a lawyer on Trump's legal team, had wholly taken on Trump's symptoms by contagion. Dershowitz responded to the tweet with a letter to Yale administrators in which he complained that Lee's tweet constituted a serious violation of the ethics rules of the American Psychiatric Association and requested that she be disciplined. The legal action listed five causes, including breach of contract, breach of good faith, and wrongful termination. The book by Alan Dershowitz that I mentioned during this portion of the episode is titled Cancel Culture, The Latest Attack on Free Speech and Due Process, and was published November 17, 2020. And the Netflix documentary featuring Dershowitz that I also mentioned is titled Jeffrey Epstein, Filthy Rich, and is available on Netflix. And now on to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight. I, I really appreciate it. It's it's an honor to, to have you here. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's, it's an honor for me to be here. <laughs> I, uh, I have known who you are for quite a while. Uh, you've, you've done some uh, pretty, I think, significant and brave things uh, when a time that it was not so easy to do those things. So I, you've kind of stuck out in my mind for a long time. So I was, uh, I was really, uh, when I saw that you followed me, I was like, Whoa, I have, I've made it or something. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And I have, I haven't finished your book, but I have, uh, about half my halfway through it. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's very interesting and, and I'm sure we'll get to all that, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool that you're here. Um, but I wanted, yeah, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to just start with, uh, go ahead and, for, I, I know who you are, obviously, but for people who don't know who you are, if you just want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, what w- what would you like me to include? Whatever you want. Whatever, okay. just personal level or just, you know, just <laughs> however you feel. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I am a violent scholar. I wrote the textbook on violence um, 
that's considered the most comprehensive textbook that is uh, basic for anyone who would like to study any form of violence. And I became known to the public through my uh, book collection of essays called The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, where I gathered a bunch of mental health professionals who were concerned about the dangers of the presidency. And so uh, that was in early 2017. I launched it with the ethics conference I held at Yale School of Medicine. And um, here we are four years later. Mm -hmm. Um, But you grew up in the Bronx, right? Yes, mostly, yes, in New York City, and um, I'm a city girl. (laughs) That's really cool, yeah. Um, But what was that like? I I did not grow up in anything like uh, that populated of an area. The town I lived in had like 3,000 people, so... Oh, uh, wow. A little bit different. Yeah, some people uh, would say uh, when I was traveling uh, with others, they would arrive into New York City. I was traveling back and forth between... Mm -hmm. Boston and New York and people would be arriving and saying do you really live packed up in those apartment buildings like sardines (laughs) for me that was normal right right um but what was uh, your family like what was what was your household like what did your parents do what did what did they want you to do <laughs> with your life yes my parents were academics and uh that's why i ended up in the bronx because my mm-hmm. father worked in the new york botanical garden oh wow and um uh they taught at universities uh, my inspiration actually was my grandfather, who was uh, a famous doctor in South Korea. And then my mother took on his um, love of medicine and um, and did a lot of healing work herself. Um, mm-hmm. Well, uh, uh, the Bronx at the time when I was growing up was actually very dangerous. And uh, my parents mm-hmm. not being familiar with uh, um, the the violent neighborhoods in the U.S. Uh, put me in public school. And uh, so I was actually going to school uh, where there were bullet holes in the windows and gangs recruiting out front. Um, there were memorials of kids dying at my age, uh, teenage kids uh, every other block. That's how I became interested in studying violence and mm-hmm. um, and uh, working to prevent it. It's been a very productive career. Uh, uh, so when people think I'm just from the ivory tower, it couldn't be more the contrary. <laughs> I've been in the streets and now in the prisons and uh, um, all over the place. Right. Well, I was going to ask if you knew what you wanted to do when you grew up from an early age, but it sounds like you were already kind of steeped in the things that caught your eye anyway that were all around you. So uh, that makes yes, sense. Yes, I wanted to be a doctor since I was very little. Right. Uh, and my grandfather was known for um, his talking to patients. So even though he was an internist, he inspired me to be a psychiatrist. Mm. Wow. Wow. Um, I read that you studied in East Africa. What was that like? Yes, yeah, so I um, I was very closely involved with the Amer- uh, African American um, people in uh, in the U.S. and mm. um, uh, also went out to Harlem uh, first to tutor homeless children, and then mm. I. Um, taught Sunday school at one of the churches Mm. and I was very inspired when I was young actually when I was eight years old I urged my parents to go back to Korea and um, didn't have such a good experience there (laughs) because Mm. uh, I was a little girl and a child and uh, that meant that your your voice didn't count 
and mm. it's a very it was very traditional hierarchical society at the time wow. and uh so i uh, d- kind of no longer had uh, uh a desire to explore asia but i had uh i had uh, attained an interest in cultures mm-hmm. and i really like the african culture and uh so i spent two years in east africa uh wow. studying uh depression at the time but mm. also um tanzania which was surrounded by countries that were succumbing to a lot of violence and tribal violence was actually very peaceful Mm -hmm. Uh, because of the enlightened uh, form of government that its first president um, uh, allowed. It was uh, Julius Nyerere, who was uh, an educator, who became president. And uh, uh, you might say it was a very enlightened rule that lasted for uh, the duration of his presidency, at least. Mm. And so I... uh, I became very inspired by the culture and felt that we had a lot to learn uh, in terms of violence prevention. And one of the things I guess was that they all considered themselves as one, even though there were 120 different tribes, uh, they were all uniform, uh, mm-hmm. unified through the Swahili language and respected one another and did not discriminate. In fact, uh, everyone had so seldom seen a a light-skinned person that they thought I was European. (laughs) (laughs) So in the countryside, they would uh, call me Mzungu, which means European. Mm. um, But I, I got to know the culture very well and speak the language and um and was very transformed by that experience when i came back to the u.s i started teaching at yale law school where students were representing asylum seekers and uh usually political asylum seekers from different regions of africa and uh, as well as from all over the world uh in fact there's quite a bit of persecution that goes on uh, in even in countries you would not expect, hmm. uh, and so so my cross cultural work was very useful that way in teaching students to interview clients, not just recognize mental symptoms because oftentimes they've gone through a great deal of trauma, but also to uh, transcend culture and to communicate uh, transculturally through. Uh, through our common humanity. Mm-hmm. Um, I I skipped past something I wanted to talk about, but you mentioned it a little bit uh, the, in the teaching the Sunday school part. Um, I, I think you have an interesting academic uh, career because you're not only an MD uh, or d- doctor of actual medicine, you're also a master of, of divinity, which I just, that does that go together a lot? It seems pretty unique. Uh, are yes, there any people that share those 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 initials on the back of their name? And I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I uh, I love the humanitarian aspect mm. of both fields, and uh, for me, it was a way to complement and complete my education in psychiatry. I was always interested in psychiatry as I told you and Mm. well since psychiatry is very focused on the body and the mind I thought I would complete it by studying the spirit and I'm very glad I did because most of the clients that I have treated patients and prisoners uh, have always gravitated greatly to um, spiritual life because they've they're undergoing essentially a crisis in life when i see them Mm -hmm. uh either because they're imprisoned or because they're uh undergoing great um suffering and so uh so spiritual relief is a great deal for them as well as for me i i -hmm. spend a great deal of time meditating and um contemplating our place in the universe and that's very comforting Mm. yeah what was your background uh, spiritually in in your life did your family was your family religious at all yes so my 
parents converted to Christianity when they came to this country as students. Mm. Uh, they didn't have a religion back in Korea, but um, mm. uh, but they were actually quite struck by uh, the humanitarian disposition of Americans from their mm-hmm. point of view, uh, the openness to strangers and uh, just how giving they were, and they attributed it to Christianity. Uh, so I grew up Protestant, and then I later tried out different religions, including Taoism and Buddhism, as well as Judaism, and mm. uh, studied different religions, uh, a bit of Hinduism too, wow. and then uh, and at one point became uh, atheist, or I would say more a naturalist, and then decided that religious practice was very uh very healing and and generative for me and so i actually ended up coming back to christianity and now i'm catholic <laughs> wow well you you've you certainly made the rounds all the way back to not where you started obviously because protestant and catholic but <laughs> close pretty close that's interesting yeah um yes i i later um realized i was just too much in my head in protestantism <laughs> And uh, the rites are are very um, meditative, and you can uh, mm-hmm. contemplate things that are beyond words. Right. So uh, it's also helpful to the practice of medicine because sometimes we can become a bit hubristic, uh, arrogant, believing mm-hmm. that our knowledge is all there is. But you know, there's a great deal of mystery of what we don't do not know, and. Um, and my yielding to the mysteries of the universe helped me to be humble and uh, be more balanced it's, in my science. It's good to be humble in that way, uh, I think. It's, it's good to not be so certain all the time. I think that's that's a healthy uh, way to feel, I think. Yes. Um, yeah, that's you have just a fascinating career. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about more your work in the jails. Um, mm-hmm. What what drew you to that work and and what did you find when you got there? Because I just don't think it's such a it's such a large part of society and it's so out of the public view and it's amazing how just cruel a lot of it is. Yes, um, yes. To put it lightly, I, I guess. <laughs> I had been calling it the criminal injustice system, and yeah. I think uh, it's it's fortunate that a lot of it is starting to get out. But for for the longest time, it has been happening exactly as you say, behind thick walls, uh, away from societal scrutiny, and uh, there's been a, a great deal of tragedy happening. So what drew me to the work? Well, I think everyone who goes into medicine is drawn to helping people and reducing suffering. Um, as I said, uh, growing up in uh, uh, around with, with a lot of violence around me, I was never really directly exposed to it, but I witnessed it. And um, so reducing violence was a great deal of my interest. Uh, A lot of people at the time did not believe it was a psychiatric field, but I did. Uh, If we did not understand it psychologically, then who would try to understand it and prevent it? And it ended up being quite prescient because after that, violence became a public health issue that has been taken up by all the different medical fields. And, uh, and I had, um, I became a pioneer in it, uh, enough to be invited by the World Health Organization when they were bringing together different specialists to try to conceive of how to prevent violence around the world. You had this like full, rich, interesting career. uh, And then Donald Trump comes along and then um, <laughs> what what happens? What do you see? And, and what would you be doing if Donald Trump hadn't come along? Just the same kind of work that you had been doing, I assume? Yes, I keep uh, dreaming of the day when I would be going back to my old work, but it hasn't right. happened yet. Um, but there was a significant event before he came around and Uh, That was the passing of my mother. Uh, She had what uh, Senator John McCain had, um, glioblastoma 
tumor. Oh. And so she went from being vibrant and the healthiest person I've seen uh, at 70 years old. She, everyone thought she was 50. She indeed didn't even have gray hair. Um, and then all of a sudden, she disappeared in 10 months. Mm. And I took care of her, but it was a terrific shock because I had experienced no loss in my family up until then, except for uh, grandparents when I was little. And um, so I uh, contemplated life a great deal, and uh, I was praying and then um, and praying and giving my life over to God, if that makes sense to you, mm -hmm. and asking, you know, what would he have me do? And he plunged me right back into the world. And my calling was indeed to respond to the election of Donald Trump because mm -hmm. she had passed earlier that year. And so uh, so that's what gave me the courage and uh, going into it full force. Mm -hmm. uh, the morning after the election, I was bombarded by phone calls, uh, email messages and um, other messages from mainly from the public actually the public that had known about my prison reform work and people who had taken my report on Rikers Island the notorious jail complex in New York City mm. and uh, and campaigned for the for the jail to be shut down and reformed mm -hmm. so I wrote the original report that that led to the federal government stepping in and then uh, uh, and then the people's movement demanding reforms that would eventually change it. Um, and so at that time, I had a great deal of connection with uh, members of the public, civil society members, uh, lawyers, documentary filmmakers and uh, students, patient advocates, all kinds of people who are getting in touch with me. Uh, because I was a violence expert and they were afraid of the violence that would come with this presidency. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were absolutely right. I had to reflect for a while, um, you know, whether it really was my place since I was never politically active and never considered the political sphere to be one where I would be participating, even though I've consulted with governments uh, in the United States and abroad on violence prevention programming, it was always policy oriented, never about politics or about a politician. But I usually tell people that it was a political sphere that invaded my area of expertise, that mm. I saw all the characteristics of the violent offenders I've been treating for 20 years uh, in this president. And uh, the dangers were great. If you uh, dangerousness has more to do with situation than the actual person. And I do dangerousness assessments all the time. Mm -hmm. And this was someone who had the greatest access to weapons and the greatest influence through his bully pulpit. And so uh, if I work to prevent violence all my career, would I turn away at the greatest prospect of violence I have ever seen? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I decided, no, uh, it was really my obligation to get involved. So, uh, so in the beginning, I didn't really speak up publicly. I wrote letters to Congress members. There was a medical consensus that he was dangerous, psychologically dangerous and probably mentally unfit. Well, mm -hmm. one is unfit if one, if one is dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was um, really no precedent to this. And even though an unprecedented number of mental health professionals came forth at the start of the presidency, uh, historically unprecedented for any president of any party, but uh, we didn't quite know what to do. So, uh, so I gathered people together at uh, an ethics conference at Yale. That was in April 2017. And one of the reasons I did it was because the American Psychiatric Association issued a gag order mm -hmm. a month prior in March 2017. And I thought that was incredibly dangerous because if there was a dangerous uh, person 
whose psychology not everyone will recognize or underestimate because people are not used to such a personality and power. And, uh, and also, many people have not experienced such a personality in power. They're usually confined in jails and prisons, uh, and their power and ability to do damage is limited. So, so what are we to do in such a situation? Do we have uh, a, an obligation to inform the public? Usually, the rule in medicine is uh, there are confidentiality laws even and all kinds of rules of ethics. But when there is danger, everything is sidelined to prioritize safety. And uh, so we are actually legally mandated to report about dangerous information we know of uh, about danger uh, and warn potential victims, as well as take steps to protect potential victims. Many times we're not even allowed simply to warn and go away. So in this situation, it's a very analogous situation to all of those settings. And we not only have a responsibility to patients, but a direct responsibility to society according to the American Psychiatric Association's own ethics guidelines. But they were telling us that there was there was no exception. We could not even talk about the dangerous figure. Mm. Uh, they used to, they had a thing called the Goldwater Rule. Right, I uh, wanted to ask you about Only the American that, Psychiatric yeah. Association has. No other mental health association has it. But it was a reasonable rule, um, meaning that uh, you don't diagnose someone in public without uh, examining them and getting authorization to talk about them. Uh, that's true for diagnosis, because you really can't diagnose someone without all medical records. Uh, well, since those days, since 1980, you don't necessarily need an interview, but you do need all medical records. Mm -hmm. But now they were saying that we cannot make any comment whatsoever, not even about dangerousness, not about un possible unfitness, which even though those are not diagnoses and those are issues that are of interest to the public. I mean, the public would, uh, one would think, wish to know if they were to be victimized uh, and have been victimized on the order of a half million dead at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, so we concluded there was no question. We had a duty to inform the public. Uh, in keeping with all the core tenets of medical ethics and the Universal Geneva Declaration, which says that uh, the humanitarian principles of medicine come first, not rules, not uh, technical um, adherences. This came after the experience of Nazism. So the Universal Declaration of Geneva was instituted in 1948. And uh, it applies to all health professionals, not just members of the APA. Um, and so this took primacy. So when there are rules that are in conflict or um, competing principles, which is usually the case in ethics, we usually act on, we weigh competing uh, benefits and risks. Uh, we don't just follow a guideline as if it were an order. But here they were issuing an order because they allowed no exception, not even in a national emergency could we talk about a public figure. Mind you, a public figure is not a patient, not our primary responsibility like patients or society. But uh, the Goldwater Rule is often even said to be not an ethics guideline, but an etiquette, etiquette toward public figures. But uh, here they were saying it superseded everything else that we were told in medicine and we couldn't say anything. So mm. I have uh, I charged the APA for violating medical ethics for preventing medical professionals from meeting their primary responsibilities uh, and and essentially for violating the um, the Geneva Declaration, which is meant to protect against destructive regimes. They specifically state that we are not to collude with uh, human rights uh, violating governments. And uh, so either 
collusion or silence would count as a violation of the declaration. And so so these were the reasonings for our putting out the book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. Uh, at first 27, later 37 psychiatrists and mental health experts assessing the president. And it became an unprecedented New York Times bestseller of its kind. It was a runaway bestseller that uh, even one of the big five publishers, Macmillan, did not anticipate and did not prepare for, that it took five weeks to plen- replenish the stocks in a way they would not run out in an hour or two. Um, so it was really a, a historic event. And within three months of publication, we were able to raise the issue of the president's mental health and fitness uh, to the number one topic of national conversation. Mm -hmm. But then at that time, the APA, uh, it was a brief period, and uh, most people remember it as, uh, as a switch turning off. That's how people have described it. Suddenly, Uh, we disappeared. Uh, Well, behind the scenes, it was the APA. The APA reasserted itself with the Goldwater Rule, calling us armchair psychiatrists, uh, even though we were performing a public health duty, not purporting to take Donald Trump as a patient. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's actually quite ludicrous uh, because they were acting as if they did not know about these basic psychiatric principles. Uh, They were basically playing the public and uh, Mm -hmm. enhancing misconceptions on the part of the public. The public is usually confused about what is diagnosis versus a violence risk assessment or um, or a fitness evaluation, which is a mental capacity evaluation. Uh, these things are not so clear in the minds of the public. For mm-hmm. As far as the public is concerned, anything that a doctor says is a diagnosis, but that's actually not true. We diagnose only a fraction of the time. So they were saying we were diagnosing, that we were um, using psychiatry as a political tool for self-aggrandizing purposes. So essentially, by this time, we were public figures and they were violating their own gag order on public figures <laughs> uh, by saying all these things without examining us and got getting uh, consent from us. So, But the effect of that has been that the Goldwater Rule, which was uh, such an unimportant rule that most psychiatrists did not know about it before Donald Trump's presidency and campaign, uh, and there are very few scholars on it because there was so little interest for, as far as we were concerned, it was outdated and no longer valid, but now it's become a household phrase for everyone else and all the media then then uh, took it as a professional authority and uh, blocked us from airing and uh, essentially um, blacked us out from public consciousness and awareness and our we our warnings went unheeded uh, our warnings were conjectures, uh, just um, a warning that he needed an evaluation up until April 2019, when we had actual information to be able to do a mental capacity evaluation. That was the Mueller report. It may not have been enough to indict a president, but it was certainly abundant Uh, overwhelming information to be able to do a very rigorous mental capacity evaluation because usually for a mental capacity we consult co-workers close associates who had direct interaction with the person in question uh, at work and this was under sworn testimony at the highest caliber of criminal investigations. And so we had the information we needed. So we assembled a panel of independent experts, top experts from around the country, and we did a standard evaluation of mental capacity. Well, guess what? He failed every criterion, which means that Mm. this was a basic capacity evaluation. So that means uh, without going into what's needed to be president, he basically failed the basic criterion for any job let alone mm. the president. Uh, so th- this pretty much predicted the response uh, that he would have to any crisis, which became the coronavirus pandemic. Mm. So we did not have to know uh, a year later that he would kill the vast majority of people who would die from the pandemic through mismanagement and through fueling the pandemic, which he in fact did. 
so that was why by the end of January, I was stating that we really had to deal with the president's mental health to be able to deal with uh, the impending epidemic of the pandemic. Um, and by March, I said uh, the, the death toll would depend not on the characteristics of the virus, but on the mental condition of the president. And by the end of March, my organization, the World Mental Health Coalition, issued um, a prescription for su survival, as we called it, stating that uh, in order to avoid an unnecessary death toll, we had to remove the president from office, whatever the means. We did not care what the means were. It could be impeachment, 25th Amendment, uh, involuntary uh, psychiatric uh, evaluation and hospitalization, or um, uh, whatever the means. And if those are not possible, or forced resignation, uh, we included that also. But if these were not possible to remove his influence by removing him from the press conferences, uh, moving the press conferences to the CDC, having only scientists be able to uh, speak about the pandemic, uh, but of course our prescription was not heeded. We issued a refill in August, again in November. They were of course not heeded, not even known about, despite our giving it to all the press and all Congress members. So, uh, so the end result is that the pandemic turned out exactly the way we warned and predicted and also the violent insurrection that almost lost us our democracy happened exactly as we predicted because we warned of such a violent event after his loss of the election and we actually did not even um, anticipate a departure date for him and that is exactly what almost happened if some uh, congress members were killed uh, as was the uh, was uh, the, the progression of events, if not for one or two brave Capitol police members, mm -hmm. uh, that is that could have very well have been the case. In that case, he could have easily invoked an emergency state or martial law in a way that he could have stayed in power. So it's really mm -hmm. frightening how close things came to our. Ex exact predictions according to the timeline of our predictions. There were several events we actually predicted, such as the massacre of our Kurdish allies. We predicted within mm. three days time, uh, we communicated our our predictions through um, a letter with 250 signatures at the time by mental health professionals to Congress members. The second time we warned of uh, a very violent event when he was upset about the impeachment process. And uh, so we warned, uh, essentially warned against something like the assassination of the top Iranian general. Uh, about a month before it happened with over 800 signatures by mental health professionals. Before the election uh, in November 2020, 100 senior mental health professionals went on video record warning that he needed to be removed from the presidency and candidacy for re-election for our nation to be safe. And, um, and of course, that ended up being prescient. So, uh, so what might have happened if mental health experts were heated, just like any other experts are ordinarily heated uh, in the time of an, a national emergency that involves that area of expertise? Uh, is now um, a question that will never be answered since the APA truncated our national discussion and uh, essentially disappeared uh, us from uh, any conversation. Uh, and so this was exactly what we were trained to recognize and trained to warn against and trained to intervene in, and uh, we were never allowed to do that. So, uh, so the nation was left unprotected, and um, all the while we could have been preventing this. Um, the, the nation was shortchanged through uh, lay pundits and untrained um, people uh, um, who were commenting on the, the 
president's mental health without uh, without training and therefore always underestimated it or or uh, normalized it and that's exactly what in fact was the reason why I held the conference in April 2017, the, a mm-hmm. month after the gag order was issued in March 2017, because this was exactly what I predicted. In fact, I said that uh, the first sign of authoritarianism was for a professional association to cede authority to power uh, and force us to cede authority. And uh, that is what authoritarian regimes do. And that if we were silenced from speaking up when mental health, when we were facing a mental health national emergency, then the president, if the president were not held accountable for his mental unfitness, then he would not be held accountable for anything else. This is what I said, and this is what happened. He was not able to be held accountable for his criminality, for his sedition, his treason, his waging war against the nation he was supposed to be protecting. None of this he has been held accountable so far. And every day, every week, and every month that he is not held accountable, the mental health pandemic, as I've called it, the spreading of his symptoms, uh, the emboldening of those who would behave in the same way, in the same criminal and unfit way that he has uh, is spreading and our ability to intervene uh, grows less and less. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, first of all, just how brave of you all to say that when it needed to be said, even if it wasn't listened to, I think, you know, that you're going to, you're going to look good when the history is written, you know what I mean? Like, it's not going to look, uh, look worse in retrospect, I think. Uh, so you're ahead of the curve on that. I mean, that was always the thing with uh, every investigation. It was always hinging on these details. It's like, oh, well, did he exactly tell the Ukraine prime minister this or that? It's like he's obviously unfit for the job. Like, let's stop. <laughs> yes. Let's let's zoom out a little bit. You know, don't get so caught up in the minutia of, of this or that detail. Like, he is not supposed to be in this chair right now. Like, he just shouldn't be. Like, his mind is disordered, like, somehow. Like, I'm not – like you said, we don't need to – armchair psychologist uh you know and, and diagnose him with anything although you could very easily with yes, <laughs> several yes. things as you point any out question, <laughs> yes we were there we were yeah. always available for consultation and um you know we're we're there as much to confirm the public suspicion and fears and anxieties of observing something that they did not understand. We were we were there. I mean, that is part of our professional duty to affirm correct assessments and to give weight based on scientific evidence mm-hmm. and years, if not decades, of clinical training that would allow us to buttress our observations and to confirm the public suspicions and the politicians' uh, um, uh, um, assertions and not make it just a partisan issue. We're, mm-hmm. we're consulted all the time by courts when, they, when there's any question. And uh, people always think about mental health issues as being exonerating. That's not always the case. Some mental impairment uh, issues are complex. Some are exonerating, some can serve as excuses, but others are predisposing and others make one even more criminally responsible when uh, when people are not so sure. We could uh, confirm that uh, sometimes the, the impairments collude with criminal mindedness and help one's criminality out uh, by um, by spreading delusions or by uh, spreading delusions of impunity. And those kinds of things can often topple uh, prosecutors and judges. And we can explain how these things happen and how they need to be held accountable because they are even more dangerous than someone who is criminally minded without impairment. In fact, Mm -hmm. that is where evil occurs and atrocities throughout history have occurred when mental pathology have combined with criminality. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's like, what good is all your expertise if you can't call it what it is when it's in your face? You know, like it's, exactly. it's, yeah, yeah, it's hard to see. It's, it's unethical to talk about things that you don't have enough information about. Mm -hmm. But when you have overwhelming information, right. <laughs> <laughs> two billion dollars confirming free itself over the 2016 and election, over. we know. <laughs> like and we've seen you it. don't <laughs> share that information, yeah. that, especially when the public is in danger endangered for their lives and the country's, if not the world's survival because mm -hmm. of the level of danger that this person poses, then that is unethical too. Right. Well, um, again, uh, I, I applaud you for sticking your neck out there when it wasn't the easiest thing to do. And um, you obviously were correct. I think <laughs> history will say that, that you, you were, you died, you're not diagnosed, but you at least identified something that was glaringly obvious. Um, but uh, okay, I want to get to uh, what happened with with uh, Yale and and what's what's going on with the legally now. But so, all right, so Alan Dershowitz, let's talk about this guy. So, uh, well, first of all, I okay. won't be able to talk. You about won't be able the to talk about it. No, okay. I right. apologize, but I will talk about Alan Dershowitz oh, or the Goldwater Rule since I have always done that. And okay. uh, if I act differently because of the lawsuit, then it does not make sense oh. that I'm trying to protect yeah. my own uh, freedom of speech. Okay. Well, uh, Alan Dershowitz is a, uh, let's see, I saw a, a Jeffrey Epstein documentary I thought was very interesting. Every, people should check it out on Netflix if you want to know more about that. You mentioned that in your, <laughs> in your, in your legal filing there, and I'm glad you did because um, it can't be said enough. Um, he, uh, boy, uh, uh, what what a guy! <laughs> he has a lot of gall. Um, he he's. Well, I, think I, he's I never took him seriously. Not, I saw yeah. him to be dangerous, uh, mm -hmm. partly because he echoes the mental impairment of the president, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I was trying to highlight. It was sure. more a public health issue, not a personal issue against him, uh, and uh, an issue that needed to be highlighted because he was posing a danger to the public. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and that is a thing of people that are around Trump. They seem to uh, adopt. They even start. Have you noticed that Lindsey Graham even kind of like dresses like him and has his fa his face is kind of orange now, and he like trying to combs his hair in the same way. It's like <laughs> is that it's very, right yet? very. Oh yeah, if you see him well, on Fox News, sometimes it looks like it's a, unsurprising. Like, but <laughs> yeah. yes, yes, this is the influence that, especially severely symptomatic persons in influential positions mm. they actually spread their symptoms and this is what most people will not understand because they're thinking mostly rationally and cognitively so the president must have convinced them somehow rationally but actually the more powerful dynamic is uh, the emotional the, the emotional bonds that have formed and the symptoms that transmit via those bonds and it's so um it's actually so dramatic and impressive in clinical settings that it is described as almost an infectious disease an infectious phenomenon uh -huh. and there are symptoms that are more infectious than others of course and so, uh, so those were important to highlight they included symptoms that the president uh, exhibited mm -hmm. Uh, well, I mean, one more, I'll just say one more thing about Alan Dershowitz. He uh, just came out with a book about free speech, did he not? <laughs> yes, someone highlighted that, that to me, and I uh, just could not stop I laughing. kind of find the irony in that a little bit. <laughs> I, can't, I can't help but think. Well, someone <laughs> confirms that something is something psychological is going on with him because sure. you know why would he and then a drive-in movie theater <laughs> yes exactly this this kind of paradox is what happens with mental pathology you tend to project people learned about projection very rapidly <laughs> with this <laughs> past administration uh you accuse the other of that which you are guilty and you claim to be championing something but while uh, in action, you are doing the exact opposite. And you actually give away your actions through mm. what you say, because uh, those who are suffering from mental symptoms uh, actually are uh, uh, anxious to disown the, the intolerable uh, symptoms, uh, the characteristics that they are, uh, that they possess. And so they 
project it onto other people. That is a defense mechanism where uh, they truly do see other people, especially their enemies, as possessing all the characteristics they actually have, especially the salient ones, uh, and they don't see the ones in themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how they deny. It helps them to deny what they have. And so it's then um, then it actually confirms what I said about him, <laughs> that he right. is exhibiting the symptoms that the president was. But anyhow, shared psychosis is sure. not a diagnosis. It mm -hmm. is a phenomenon. It is a collective phenomenon. It usually happens in households or gangs. Uh, I've witnessed it a great deal in violent gangs. But uh, when it happens through an entire population, a segment of the country, then we have to call it out what, for what it is. It doesn't suddenly change because it's, uh, it doesn't change its nature just because it's affecting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Mm -hmm. So yes, the phenomenon is shared psychosis. It's not a diagnosis. It's a social phenomenon um, where mental characteristics manifest in a population. And uh, when mental pathology, when principles of mental pathology apply to a population, you don't suddenly say it, it, uh, it's no longer mental pathology just because mm -hmm. it's not individual mental illness. In fact, most Trump supporters and most people who are exhibiting shared psychosis, when you see them individually, they may be perfectly normal. Mm -hmm. um, but shared psychosis is adoption of symptoms. And mm -hmm. as, as long as you are exposed, you almost look identical to the primary individual to the point where secondary individuals are indistinguishable. You don't know who has the primary illness. It's only through history uh, and inquiring uh, family members, for example, uh, how it actually began and deciphering for yourself who is the primary member. And once you separate the secondary members and hospitalize the primary person, the secondary persons actually return to their normal state. So that is why it, it was so important to remove the president from uh, from influence, uh, not just from the presidency, but from exposure and influence. And we saw the immediate effect of removing him from social media. But of course, his influence has not gone away because mm. uh, now we have lots of mini Trumps and copycats and um, and uh, people uh, are, are constantly um, idealizing and identifying with him. And that is why conviction was so critical prosecution mm. so critical because um, discrediting him, um, uh, uh, neutralizing his, his influence is critical. And so far, we have not done that. Mm. Uh, we have voted him out, out of office, and that's uh, truly um, a commendable feat on the part of the uh, the American people against all odds and obstacles. If you know mm -hmm. about shared psychosis, it's actually like a hijacking of the mind. So when when half the population is hijacked, how do you uh, defend yourself against that simply through voting? It's simply unconscionable that we have left everything on the shoulders of the American public. But it has stepped up and, and come forth and managed to vote him out. But it was, other than that, it was treated entirely as a normal presidency, even after the, the attempted coup. Mm. So um, so this is very problematic for the for the for society's mental health and for his followers' mental health as uh, cult members. Uh, shared psychosis is actually the psychological dynamic that happens in cults. So when people describe um, uh, Trump followers like a cult, it may not have the physical uh, attributes of a cult, such as, you know, isolation and mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, and blocking of outside information. But psychologically, the same dynamic is obviously happening because, you know, it's happening in people's uh, in people's communities, in in the same uh, neighborhoods among family members and even in the same couple relationship. Why is this cult-like relationship happening? It's because the barriers are psychological. Uh, the insulation has happened through psychologically rejecting anything uh, outside of this cult membership. Mm. And, 
uh, insulating people, immunizing people against real news uh, mm. and, and constantly uh, making them listen only to disinformation uh, as news. Uh, our societal conditions have allowed for that. Uh, disinformation should never have been allowed to be called news. Uh, but it has served as as a as an indoctrinating indoctrinating mechanism, and so it works very much like a cult. So it's not surprising that shared psychosis is a result, and it's also something I predicted. Uh, I talked about shared psychosis since the beginning of the presidency, and when I said that uh, that Donald Trump's presidency was more dangerous than people were uh, uh, recognizing, that it would grow more dangerous with time and eventually that it would become uncontainable unless we intervened. I was talking about shared psychosis. Mm. Yeah. Uh, when I, I used to be a reporter at a newspaper in Northern California and I interviewed a uh, survivor of Jonestown. She was about 12 mm -hmm. when it happened. And uh, I'm still friends with her on Facebook. And recently I, I sent her a message and I'm like, is this Trump thing just like a bad rerun for you? And she's like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like, it's yes. like, it's the same thing over again. He has like in Jonestown, Jim Jones had his megaphone set up all over the place and he would like, you know, he would he would tell them there was always the threat coming in and the CIA was always going to come in and there was constant threat and, you know, only trust me. And uh, even down to the hair and the, you know, everything, you know, it's like it's it's crazy um, how, how yes, similar uh, actual is. cult members recognized it. So other yeah. than specialists. Uh, who have actually treated such people like myself, uh, it was victims and um, survivors of cults and um, and this kind of experience who recognized it. Uh, ex those who experienced the Holocaust mm, experience yeah. uh, recognized this. And uh, Dr. Steve Hassan, who wrote The Cult of Trump, he's a cult, uh, a former cult member mm. of the Moonies who oh, uh, wow. recognized okay. it right away. So right. Um, so it was, it had all the cardinal signs and it is quite unfortunate that uh, we're, we downplayed it and continue to downplay it. In fact, uh, a number of pharmaceutical company um, affiliated psychiatrists have come forth saying there's no such thing as shared psychosis, even though it's a documented phenomenon uh, mm. since the 1800s and numerous scientific papers have been written about it. So it's not something that I've just come up with, although it's right. been called different things. Previously, it was called Folie à plusieurs, uh, madness among several. Uh, mm. Folie à famille, when it happens in a family. Or folie à millions, when it happens among millions in a nation. Um, and uh, the latest designation is induced delusions, which I am not satisfied with because, well, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, fifth edition is largely uh, financed by the pharmaceutical industry and um, and so they came down to saying it's only delusions but of course there's historic documentation even in my own experience I've seen a lot more symptoms than delusions being transmitted mm. um, and so it's it's grossly inadequate but they're they're trying to make uh, mental uh, disorder only individual uh, and confined to the person so that you can treat them biologically when they when you see them in your office but obviously mm -hmm. they're group phenomena and social phenomena right well I have you know I've taken up an hour of your time tonight and I don't want to keep you any longer so I'm <laughs> I just want to say uh, thank you so much I could I could talk to you for a, a much longer time uh, I hope you do come back though I've I've got more <laughs> more questions oh, yes, uh, I would love you. to yes yeah this has been a lot of fun uh, but the question I always ask before uh, we go here is what music have you been listening to lately Oh gosh well you'll laugh if you hear the music I listen to uh, well, I listen to Baroque music, which is oh. a little more normal, uh, and Gregorian chants. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. No, my uh, my kids are doing, uh, they're learning about the composers uh, now, so we're going back through Beethoven and Bach and Tchaikovsky, and it's it's been fun yes, to learn. Yes, I'm, I'm teaching that to my children, too. Oh, neat. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, yes, yeah. That's, that's essential. 
Great. Yeah. No, we're actually supposed to get a uh, piano tomorrow, so we're all going <laughs> to learn how to play piano in this house while we're all stuck here together. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a great idea. We've been yeah. constantly at the piano <laughs> pandemic, and it's been very uh, exhilarating. Yeah. yeah the thing that has been very good about the pandemic is that it increased the love of music and the love oh, of yeah. reading. Oh, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Well, do you have any book recommendations for us? What have you been reading? Oh, well, uh, books that have to do with my concerns for society. And in fact, I have <laughs> not, been... not like light, be, be treated. No. <laughs> in fact, I have been reading about Jonestown and, oh, and really? Charles Manson and other things for my next book, oh, wow. uh, where I will uh, discuss a lot of case studies from what I've experienced of gangs and uh, gang leaders uh, spreading their symptoms and essentially shared psychosis is oh, wow. a, a great deal of what I have seen working in the public sector setting, but also something that is very relevant to our national situation now, but I haven't studied it in, in other contexts, and so mm -hmm. I'm comparing the observations and the similarities are, are, are just uh, astonishing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, well, I've been reading uh, the the book of my good friend and um, uh, and fellow board member Ruth Ben Giet, uh, in that mm. um, she has written about um, fascist leaders over time. So I oh, she's recommend great. her book. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I've I've read some of her stuff. She's really good. She's um, the most psychologically minded uh, historian and <laughs> fascist scholar I have met. So we we connect very well. And and sure. I'm very public health oriented, uh, having done uh, having applied psychiatric principles to public health settings for my uh, 20 year career. So we mm -hmm. connect very closely. Great, great. Uh, Tell her to come on the show. That'd be fun. But uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. But uh, thank you so much uh, for coming. And uh, I'd love to talk with you about more uh, scary and interesting things <laughs> again another time. So. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Have thank a you very day. much for having me. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, RSS, and now Spotify. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. If you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to therobburgessshow at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Also, if you want to call or text the show for any reason, the number is 317-674-3547. Until next time.